Hey, do you remember this very excruciating attempt at a walking interview by our own Kean Bexty in Washington, D.C.? Take a look. Ilhan, if I could get a moment of your time, if I could get a moment of your time, could you tell me why you filed illegal tax returns in 2014 and 2015? And it's which committee? Uh, can you tell me definitively or not, is Ahmad Elsi your brother? For the Maka? Yeah. Is he your brother? We're in the middle of the legislative we're briefing. The, we're going, yeah. I, is he your brother? We're going to which one? It's Foreign Affairs. I'll go with you. Can you tell me definitively, yes or no, is he your brother? Um, and why can't you answer that question? The remarks you gave me earlier. Why did you refer to him as your child's uncle on Instagram? And why did you lie on court documents saying that you hadn't seen him since 2011, when in fact you'd been talking to him all the time on Instagram? Sir, we're not doing ambush interviews. This isn't an ambush. So you can send me a, an email. Why are you so afraid to answer these questions? I gotta tell you, if someone asked me if I had married my sister, my first reaction would be to explosive laughter. I'd say, what? And then if they were serious, I'd say, no, of course not. I found it extremely odd that she would not answer those questions. But there are many odd things about Ilhan Omar, the hijabi Muslim migrant to the United States who is now a congresswoman. Kian has done some great work trying to get answers on the scene. But now there's a new book with the wonderful name American Ingrate that I think just perfectly sums up Ilhan Omar. And we're glad to be joined now via Skype from New York City with the author of American Ingrate, Benjamin Weingarten, who is also a senior contributor at The Federalist. Welcome to the channel. American Ingrate, I have to com compliment you. That's how she strikes me, someone who left left the world's worst country by any measure, Somalia, came to one of the world's best countries, America, was given everything, has high privileges and status, and yet so clearly despises her new home. American ingrate, that's just perfect. Well, Ezra, thanks for having me and uh, appreciate the praise on the title, which I agree really gets to the core of what so irks people about Ilhan Omar, someone who has risen to the height of power in Washington, D.C. as not only a congresswoman who sits on the House Foreign Affairs Committee dealing with her most sensitive national security and foreign policy information, uh, but as well as someone who is the co-chair for Bernie Sanders' campaign in the all-important state of Minnesota in 2020, someone who has put out a battery of bills that Ben Rhodes, the former National Security Council official from the Obama administration, has called the new progressive baseline. And the fact we can't even get basic answers about this alleged, and I think heavily substantiated, issue of marriage fraud associated with potentially marrying her brother, which implicates also immigration issues, perjury, all manner of other crimes as well, is a remarkable thing. And I will say that after this book came out, reflecting the fact that she and her camp have never grappled with these issues and may never grapple with these issues, is that within days, her campaign put out a fundraising email in which they claimed that my book was incitement and I was trying to incite violence against her as an Islamophobe and she threw all sorts of other invective at me. When this is a book with 1200 endnotes that is heavily, diligently substantiated and grapples with all manner of issues regarding Ilhan Omar. Her background plays just one small part in one chapter, and that alone illustrates the danger of Ilhan Omar, that th these compromising issues are barely a footnote in her entire record, and the fact that she would attack anyone who dares subject her to the same scrutiny that every American elected official should be subjected to uh, reflects the fact that she doesn't want us to know the truth about her. Yeah, you're so you said a lot of things there, but the fact that she would imply that your book about her is some sort of call to violence, it's incredible. Let me play a few clips that you refer to in your book. One is when she calls 9-11 the worst terrorist attack in American history, the worst death toll in America since, uh, since uh, the attack on Pearl Harbor. Some people did something. Here, take a quick look at that. Some people did something? Just so blasé. I want to show you one more thing. Uh, she was doing a TV show and she called, she, she praised Al-Qaeda, how people even say Al-Qaeda. Take a quick look at this. 
And so it was, it was the, the thing that was interesting in the class was every time the, the, the professor said Al Qaeda, he sort of like his shoulders yeah. went up and, you know, yeah, he's in command like, here. Al Qaeda, you know, has been. He's an expert. <laughs> Thanks for letting me show those clips, Benjamin. I, my point is, she has the audacity to imply that you support violence when she either praises the honor of Al-Qaeda or writes off 9-11 as, oh, some people did something. Yeah, she treats a, a disaster, a jihadist attack perpetrated on Americans so flippantly. And then actually, if you read the full context of her remarks, because she'll always claim that her quotes are taken out of context, what she's actually trying to argue in that clip is that Muslims were the real victims because they were brought under the scrutiny of American law enforcement after 9-11. And she frequently portrays herself as the victim, as she did in response to my own book. And as for al-Qaeda, it's even worse worse than just the notion of trying to create legitimacy. But she argues in that clip that Al Qaeda is essentially somehow morally equivalent to the US military, for example. This is someone who sits on the House Foreign Affairs Committee. Hmm. It's absolutely remarkable that someone could have access to our most sensitive national security and foreign policy information with views like these. And as I delve into at great length in American Ingrate, in a time where we are so concerned in America, supposedly, about foreign interference and collusion in, in our elections, in our political system, Ilan Omar has substantial ties to Islamists, both domestic in terms of terror-tied groups like the Council on American-Islamic Relations, as well as foreign, including leadership in both the Turkish and Somali governments as well. I added an op-ed in the New York Post about her ties to the Erdogan regime just about a week ago. It is truly staggering when you consider not just her rhetoric, but her actions and her associations as well, that this is someone who is a leader getting light in the Democratic Party today. Yeah. Well, that's the incredible thing is that, <clears throat> listen, uh, if she was elected in a heavily Somali district in Minnesota, there's only so many things that the broader political establishment can do about that. If you have mass Muslim immigration that ghettoizes itself, you were going to get a reflection of that demographic. But she has been elevated to these high positions and accepted by Senior people in the party, whether it's Bernie Sanders or you mentioned Ben Rhodes, the former Obama administration, Poobah, or even just Nancy Pelosi giving her uh, various committee assignments, she is who she is, but she has been held up as a symbol of the Democratic Party by others who should know better. Why don't they know better? Do they want to capture the Muslim vote? Do they want to capture... Like, why would... The Democratic Party, which historically, for example, has been the party that many Jews supported. Uh, Fifty years ago, you could even say it was a party that believed in national defense. Uh, I, mean, I guess it's longer than that for John F. Kennedy. But what is in it for the Nancy Pelosi's and the Bernie Sanders of the world to promote such a radical? Yeah, you, you make a lot of interesting points there. And, and what I argue in the book is that really this sort of switch that has happened in the Democratic Party, and it is encapsulated in the issue of Israel and those who purport to be anti-Zionist when in reality they're Jew haters. Israel is sort of the proxy for a whole host of other issues as to where the Democratic Party has shifted. You're absolutely right. Nancy Pelosi caved first when the Democrat-controlled House would not censure Ilhan Omar by name and for her invocation of anti-Semitic tropes specifically. And it even started before that, as you noted, when Pelosi made a deal with the devil, with the progressives, and put Ilhan Omar on that House Foreign Affairs Committee in the first place. And as to the question of why, I think it is twofold. There's a part of this which is sort of cynical ideological uh, and partisan, which deals with the fact that Ilhan Omar and those like her represent sort of the personification of the multiculturalist, intersectionalist, identity politics, grievance-based victimology part of the Democratic Party. They stand sort of as at the highest point on that privilege or anti-privilege hierarchy. And so there's a political reason why 
Democrats believe in promoting Ilhan Omar and her acolytes. And then there's also the fact that the Muslim population in America votes or self-identifies at about two thirds or more Democrat. It's a substantially growing population. And if you think the views on Israel and Jewish people generally are odious, then I think you have to consider, and I make this case in the book, that Democrats are basically trading Jewish votes for Muslim votes. Muslim votes will be a growth industry for the Democratic Party, and increasingly the Jewish vote for Democrats is likely going to decline or become de minimis. And what I argue in the book extensively is that the forgotten person in all of this is Barack Obama. Barack Obama, over eight years Years, paved the way for Ilhan Omar's radical rhetoric, her radical policies, her associations with all manner of Islamists and other radicals, both foreign and domestic. He's the forgotten player in all this, and he hasn't gotten his due, but in my book, I give him his due. That's, a, that's an excellent point. And I should tell you, up here in Canada, uh, where a Somali migrant became Justin Trudeau's immigration minister, and by the way, Ahmed Hassan, as you can see in this photo, is quite chummy with Ilhan Omar, which is terrifying. In Canada, that math you talked about has absolutely come true. The Jewish population in Canada has remained static at about 1%, whereas the Muslim population is now 3 4%. Trudeau can do the math, and he knows which side of that divide he's on on many policies. Um, let me ask you this. Is there any way to stop it? Is there any way to roll back this move? I see that Bernie Sanders um, staggered a bit in the Super Tuesday Democratic primaries, but I don't think that that's a rebuke of Ilhan Omar. I'm, I'm, I think I'm stretching too far. Maybe, maybe online Twitter Democrats are a little edgier than actual Democrats who show up to vote. But is that wing of the party, the AOCs, the Ilhan Omars, is it strong on the ground or is it more a media concoction? How can Democrats take ownership of their party again, working Democrats, uh, working class, middle class Democrats, non-radical Democrats, or is that moment past? I think what we're witnessing right now in real time is the last gasp fight of the Democratic establishment against the progressive Young Turks, so to speak. And, and what I would say is that while this might not be reflected in an AOC-dominated House and AOC becoming speaker in, t in 2020 or two or even four years down the road, just one statistic that I cite in the book is very staggering, and that's that when the Congressional, congressional Progressive Caucus caucus was founded in the early 90s, there were six members, including Bernie Sanders. Speaker Pelosi was also one of the early members before she left when she became minority leader the first time around. Today, there are nearly 100 members of the Congressional Progressive Caucus, more than 40 percent of all Democrats forming the majority in the House are members of the Congressional Progressive Caucus. I'd simply ask, in terms of their political power, would Nancy Pelosi, under normal circumstances in a pre-squad world, have pushed for the impeachment charade that we witnessed in America? Would Gerald Nadler, would Elliot Engel, would even necessarily Adam Schiff? I think it's very clear. And also, would Democratic presidential candidates be staking out the most left positions that we've ever seen from a de Democratic field from its very start? I think the answers are self-evident. And that should tell you the fact that Democrats are good at math. They can count. They see that the future is one that progressives stand to inherit. And I think what you're seeing is this generational and ideological divide playing out in real time. But the sort of fight between the Mensheviks and Bolsheviks is going to rage on beyond this election. Well, that is terrifying. Uh, we started by showing you a clip and then you gave us more commentary on uh, the immigration and marriage fraud issues that have embroiled Ilhan Omar. And, and you're right, there, she hasn't confessed to them, but there's so much evidence that has come forward. As you say, they're largely substantiated. Al Capone, in the end, was undone, not in a bank robbery or a murder, but through mail fraud, wire fraud, like a technical offense that put him away. Um, Ilhan Omar's greatest offense to the world was not the fake marriage to her brother, a sham marriage for immigration purposes, but it may be her undoing. What do you think the likelihood is of that turning into a formal criminal charge. 
I, I know that, um, you know, uh, prosecutions of any crime have to be done in a nonpartisan way, and it can't be just ordered up by some politician. But do you think it's likely that Ilhan Omar will be prosecuted for that crime? And do you think that'll take her out of the game? Well, let me say this. First of all, as to the state of our justice system in America, when it comes to made men and made women to stick with the sort of mafia parlance that you reference in terms of Al Capone, it's very clear there's a double standard in our justice system. And that alone, I think, speaks to the challenge of me believing that the odds are strong that there will be prosecution of Ilhan Omar on top of the fact that there are potentially statute of limitation issues as well. But all of that said, she acts with such impunity that I think it's very likely for there to be any number of missteps. And in some sense, her lawlessness and her kind of just flaunting the fact that she can do whatever she wants uh, is indicative of not just ingratitude, but that lawlessness bleeds into animus and a lack of respect for the country, which cannot happen if you're a legislator. Your job is to abide by the laws. But what I will say is that there have been ethics violations that have been committed. And it's also very clear that she also fudged her tax forms in part relating to that original likely marriage fraud and that she filed jointly for taxes for at least two years with a man who was not her legal husband. So do I think there's more criminality likely to come and ethics violations to come? Absolutely. But there needs to be an outcry and it has to be a bipartisan outcry. And the sad thing about her district, and you mentioned the large Somali refugee population there, is that it is really based Based upon my time spent on the ground there, the white woke elites, the upper crust in the Minnesota Twin Cities area, the Minneapolis Twin Cities area, who are really her biggest supporters. She has actually enraged some portions of her fellow Somali refugees. And the biggest whistleblowers have ironically been Somali American Muslim refugees who feel that she is such a danger that she must be exposed. That's a really telling fact. Isn't that incredible? We're talking uh, with Benjamin Weingarten, the author of American Ingrate. I have one last question for you. And by the way, we're going to have a link underneath this video in the description to the Amazon page. Fascinating. Something that we've been interested in from afar up here in Canada. Now, Donald Trump has deliberately shone the spotlight on the squad, not so much in the last few months as the Democratic presidential primaries have taken center stage. But before that, I think Trump's strategy, if I can guess, was to emphasize the craziest part of the Democratic Party, to make that the face of it, to show to middle America, um, as opposed to, say, a Joe Biden face of the campaign. Uh, what do you think of, of Trump emphasizing the wackiness, wacky is too gentle a word, emphasizing the radicalness of Ilhan Omar and Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez? Um, is there a danger that Trump thinks it's offensive, but he's actually giving more oxygen to Omar and AOC who might be successful? What do you think Republicans should do, I guess is what I'm asking. Yeah, well, my view is be careful what you wish for. It, it looks like Bernie Sanders may be done effectively after what's transpired over the last 72 hours, which shows you the power that remains in the Democratic establishment. But all that said, I don't think that if the general election had been Bernie Sanders versus Donald Trump, that it would have been such a layup as many people seem to believe, because in part, the Bernie Sanders AOC squad progressive wing really has a message that they ardently believe in and articulate, and they have a very passionate base, much more impassioned than the Democratic establishment's supporters. So what I would suggest is this. It certainly pays to emphasize the radical part of the Democratic Party on the politics, but I think substantively, it's actually right. I, I think the president is right. This is the core of the Democratic Party. It is not the majority yet. It may be a plurality, but ultimately, I believe, and I argue in this book, that it stands to triumph, that today we may have a squad, but tomorrow it might be a battalion and bigger than that, because 
all of the trends in American life, whether you look at woke capital and the executives who run our corporations and their radical leftism, or you look at multi-generations of schools producing people like Ilhan Omar and AOC and Rashida Tlaib and the others, you look at all of our core institutions, essentially, they're dominated by people who think like the squad and who want to hold the squad up. And it is really the white woke elites that have swung the most left over the last couple of decades. And they have substantial political power relative to other demographic groups when you break it down by demographics. So all that said, I think in the long run, it is the squad's party to lose, but it's going to be a knockdown drag out fight as this works itself out. And as a conservative, I'll look forward to it with a big bag of popcorn. Hmm. Amazing. Well, I'm so glad that you made some time for us. I know Ilhan Omar is a big issue in the United States, but she has been turned into a sort of heroine in Canada's media party as well. And no doubt, in some ways, we're further progressed down that road in our country up here, too. The book's called American Ingrate. You can buy it at the Amazon link in the description below. We've been talking with author Benjamin Weingarten, who's also a senior contributor at The Federalist. Great to have you with us today. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Ezra. Appreciate it. All right. Our pleasure. That's an excerpt from my daily show, The Ezra Levant Show. Every day I do a monologue on the news of the day, then I interview an interesting guest, and then I read my hate mail. you got to subscribe. Go to rebelnews.com.